Last time on object-oriented programming, we looked at the basics. We looked at what object-oriented programming is without discussing how to actually do it. Today, let's change that. Let's delve into some of the basics of OOP. More on this after the break. Hello and welcome back to another episode of OOP. Today, we're going to look at some of the key important terms in object-oriented programming as well as to put those into practice. First of all, there are two key terms, class and object. And today, let's clear up the difference between those two terms. We'll first define them, you know, talk about them in an intuitive, theoretical way, and then we'll move over to Java to implement those. So let's begin by talking about classes. Essentially, a class is a definition. It is a blueprint. It describes the structure and content of things, and it tells you basically how to build an object. So knowing what a class is, we can define what an object is. And as it turns out, an object is simply an instance of a class. If a class is a blueprint, an object is what we can construct by following the blueprint. That is as intuitive as it gets. Your classes form your definitions. You can use these definitions to construct your objects. So with this picture in mind, let's delve deeper into classes and see what exactly we put in them. The things we write in classes fall into two broad categories, attributes and methods. Now, attributes are essentially variables. They describe something about the object itself, and essentially they are what we use to hold the state of the object. The methods are ways in which we can manipulate the object itself, and essentially they are expressed as functions. So let's take a step back and think about all the things we've mentioned. Classes are blueprints or definitions, and within these definitions, we describe attributes, which are, well, variables or states, and methods, which are functions. Based on all these things, we can construct our individual objects. Each one of these individual objects hold their own state, and we can perform actions to each one of them independently of each other. That is essentially the big picture of OOP. To make things more concrete, let's use a simple example. And my favorite example of OOP is the idea of a ball. Let's say we want to capture two pieces of information about balls, their size and their color. These, of course, are our attributes. So each ball has size and color. Now, let's say we want to perform some actions on a ball. Of course, the most basic one would be to kick it. Of course, for that to work, we need to have some notion of its position. So let's add position as an additional attribute. With that in place, we can introduce a kick method. This method will allow us to, well, kick the ball, right? And when we kick the ball, we'll say its position changes. This essentially is a very simple class definition. We have our attributes and we have our methods. And based on these, we can model basic ball behavior, right? Based on this class, we can now instantiate a couple of balls. Maybe, let's say B1 has a particular size and color, B2 has a different size and color. What we can then do is we can say, I want to kick B1, right? And when you kick it, its position changes. Its position is updated based on the kick method. As you can imagine, I could easily scale this up. If I wanted to represent 100 balls, I could still stick to the same class, right? The same blueprints. The behavior of each individual ball doesn't change. I just need to instantiate it 100 times, and each ball will have its own properties and states, right? They have their own size, color, and position. And we can manipulate each ball independently of each other. Kicking one ball isn't going to affect another ball, despite the fact that they all behave the same way. That's the cool thing about OOP. If you write your blueprint well, your program can scale up very easily. Of course, the ball example is a toy example. Right? But we can easily turn this into something a little bit more real-world relevant. For example, we can have an employee record class. This employee record class may hold things like, say, name, right? say, the hourly rates if that's a part-time employee. The methods could involve things like calculating their salary. You get the idea, right? Remember, OOP is just a modeling tool, and depending on how we model things, the behavior of our program changes accordingly. At the end of the day, when we have a good blueprint defined, we can just instantiate it as many times as we need. Whether we have 10 or 1,000 employees, we can use the same blueprints, and 
yeah, the behavior is exactly as we expect. That's the power of OOP. So with all of that, I would say it's about time to look at the code. Now, there are a lot of things in OOP that we haven't really discussed yet. So while we will be writing a full on ball class, um, there will be some things that I will defer the explanation for. So don't mind me, I'll explain whatever that, well, we have the background to understand at this point. So to start off with, we definitely need our class, right? This is where we started last time. And of course, we'll also need our main function as well. This allows us to actually run our program. What we can do is we can start to build our class. Firstly, let's build our attributes. In this case, our three attributes are size, color, and position. So these are our three attributes. At the same time, we also have our methods. Since we have only discussed our kick method, let's go ahead and do that. So for this, right, we'll increment the position by three. This essentially are the attributes and methods that we've described. Even with just this, we are already able to instantiate our class, like so. Essentially, instantiating a class is like creating a new variable, but when you're instantiating, you have to say new and just name, you know, the object that you want to create. And there you go, B is now an instance of ball. Unfortunately, at present moment, we are not really able to, well, do very much with this ball yet. This is something that we'll attempt to make better in the coming episodes. And of course, there are quite a lot of things that you haven't seen before. These will get explained in due course as well. But just so we can actually see something, I'm going to create another function called display. What this function is going to do is it's simply going to give a report about, well, everything about that particular ball. So it's going to say ball size, that will be the size, ball color, as well as ball position, like so. What we can then do is we can say b.display. This is how you run a function on a particular object. You say, on this particular object, I want to run this function. So let's see what results we get. We compile the file using a function called javac, and then we run it. This is what we see. Now, of course, these values are hopefully not too surprising. We haven't defined any of these, and right now we have no ability to do so. As we move along, we'll try and see how we can do that. So what that means is the only thing we get to play with right now is kick. Now, what I'm going to do is we already know what the ball is like at this point in time, right? It is zero, null, zero. What I can then do is I can run the kick function before I run the display function. Now, I'll let you take a moment to imagine what's going to happen as I compile this file. So we're going to run it, right? And let's see if that matches what you imagine. The position is three. Did that match what you imagined? The whole idea is at the beginning, the ball position is zero. After I've run kick on it, it now has become three when I try to display it here. That's the idea, right? That is how you can run an operation on an object and see that value. So hopefully things are still okay at this point, despite the fact that I've glossed over some details. Um, I think the most prominent ones are the private and public aspect of things. Uh, you may be wondering why this function has static and why these do not. These are all things that we will explain in due course. At present moment, hopefully the basics are okay. The key points you need to take away are introducing attributes over here, introducing methods like so and how these methods can work with the attributes as well as instantiating an object as well as running functions on it. That's all the code we're going to look at for today but like I said not to worry as we move on we are going to be looking at more code we're going to be going more in depth. Now I want to go back to our first episode right we discussed the advantages of object-oriented programming if you recall, one of them I mentioned was encapsulation. Today, we've seen encapsulation at work. When we define a class, we're essentially grouping everything together into a logical unit. Now, today, we haven't put a lot of emphasis on code. So for today, focus more on 
well, the actual theoretical aspect. But yeah, that's basically all I have for you today. Hopefully today's session was useful, thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe, you know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.